then Jesus told them a parable about how they were to pray always and not lose heart. Pray always and not lose heart. I read those words this week in the midst of all of the stuff coming at us in this election season, and I thought to myself, are you kidding me? Not lose heart at this time in this season? If I, when I feel like if I hear one more word out of those crazy people, I am going to rip my own heart out of my chest and ask somebody to stomp on it with golf cleats? Are you kidding me? Pray always and not lose heart with all of this circus going on around us. And Jesus told them a parable about how they were to pray always and not lose heart. The American Psychological Association this week has started talking about election stress disorder. Did you know this? Election stress disorder. And they actually published some tips on how to get through this season Pray always and not lose heart. It struck me this week that one of the hardest things about being at this point in an election season is remembering that the rest of the world is still there, right? That the rest of the news is still going on because it is so drowned out by all the things coming out of this circus that surrounds us. And yet, if we dig a little bit past those initial headlines and how it is dominating all of our news cycle, we'd still see, we do see that Haiti is still there, still recovering. And now, after all that devastation of the hurricane, now cholera has shown up. And parents are carrying their children for miles out of the mountains so they can find some place to get an IV in them. We hear from Aleppo, and we still have hospitals being, being bombed in Syria. This week I read that in Nigeria, their crisis is so severe that they predict 75,000 children are going to die this next year from hunger. That's twice the size of our town, over twice the size. All children that are likely to die of hunger this year. And our own pastor Erica brought us stories, is bringing us stories from the slums in South Africa, a way of life and a situation that's almost impossible for us to imagine. And all of those stories are still going on. They're just being drowned out. Or if we want to stay closer to home. There was a story this week of a seven-year-old boy in Chicago, not very far away, who was found running against traffic in the southbound side of Lakeshore Drive. He was seven years old and wearing only a soiled diaper. Someone called 911 and they came and found him. And when they found him, they took him to the hospital and the doctor said he was in worse shape and more beaten and bruised than he had ever seen. He had a big gash on his forehead, malnourished, scars, bruises, And in talking with them, they learned that, they asked him, who did this? And he says, my mommy. That for the past two years, he has been mostly locked in a closet, beaten with a baseball bat, a pole, and electrical cords, fed cans of okra and protein shakes that uh, his mother and boyfriend put up cameras in the house so they could keep an eye on him when he was gone. For two years, living like that. And that's just right next door. No matter what this election circus tries to make us believe, this is the world that we live in. And this is going on. This world is hurting. This world is hungry. This world is is bruised and battered. There are children suffering right here in Valparaiso or over in Chicago. We are surrounded by hunger and hatred. We are surrounded by people who want to kill children. We are surrounded by a world that is dark and that is scary. And Jesus told them a parable about how they should pray always and not lose heart. Pray always and not lose heart. And I asked myself this week, with that kind of news surrounding us, 
the real world that we live in, with this kind of world that we're in the midst of and that we are called to show, shine our lights onto, how do we pray? How can we have a light to shine? And what is it that this kind of world needs most? Pray always and not lose heart. How do we do that? As I was thinking about Jacob there in our first reading from Genesis, Jacob who comes to the river Jabbok, I don't know about you, but I didn't have much trouble picturing what was going through his mind. He is on his way back home, and it's been years since he's been there. Last time he was home, his brother Esau wanted to kill him, was actively trying to murder him, and for frankly pretty good reason. Because Jacob is a trickster. He's a swindler. He's a cheat. And he cheated his brother Esau, his older brother, out of his inheritance. He stole his birthright, taking advantage of Esau's simple nature. And Esau was furious. So Jacob had to run. He had to skedaddle out of town, leave his home area, and go for a number of years. And now he's on his way back. Now he has to come back, and now he has to face Esau, and he's heard the word that Esau's on his way, and he's got a whole mess of folks with him, and he's going to have to face him tomorrow. Tomorrow is the day. And so as they're on their way, Jacob and his crowd come to the river Jabbok, and he's got one night left, one chance to think and scheme and come up with a plan. And so he sends his wives and his children and his cattle and his livestock and his servants, everybody across the river says, you all go and camp over there. I'm going to stay back on this side. And he's going to spend the night, I'm positive, trying to think up a plan to keep himself from getting killed. And so he's there pacing in the night as the sun goes down, working, talking to himself, thinking, how am I going to prevent this kind of bloodshed? I know what Esau wants to do to me because I remember. And he's waiting and he's coming with a whole group of men. He's pacing and when it happens, there in the dark with no warning whatsoever, a man jumps him out of the bushes tackles him there in the night. Now, I'm positive that Jacob would have figured Esau has come to get me. At least he would have thought that at first. And as near as we can tell in how Genesis tells us, the whole wrestling match is silent. There in the dark, rolling on the river bank by the river Jabbok, they are equally matched, Jacob and this mystery assailant, this mystery man that has leaped out of the bushes to tackle him. They are wrestling the whole night. First one will get a slight advantage and then the other using all their strength, their might, rolling, grunting, groaning. They're uh, holding on and wrestling there on the riverbank. And they are equally matched the whole night until in the east the horizon starts to get painted with a little bit of gray, the sign of the morning coming at to re meet the dawn. And then this mystery assailant pulls a dirty trick, pulls a trick on the trickster and knocks his hip out of joint, hits him right there, right there, and knocks his hip out of joint. But Jacob is not one to lose heart. Jacob is not one to give up easy. Jacob holds on, groaning as that light in the east gets lighter. And he starts to say, and, and the mystery man says, let me go, dawn is here. And Jacob says, no. Give me a blessing. Tell me your name. And they wrestle some more. And Jacob demands, give me a blessing. And as dawn is approaching, this mystery man gives Jacob not just a blessing, but something he never, never would have expected, a new name. And with a new name comes a new reality, a new self, a new life. He will no longer be Jacob. But Israel, he who wrestles with God. He who wrestles with God. 
And when the sun comes up, there is Jacob limping, limping on his way to meet Esau. And he says, that place is Peniel, because I have seen the face of God, the face of God. And I survived, but I will never be the same. Israel, those who wrestle with God. And I thought to myself, in the midst of this kind of week and in the midst of this kind of world, that that feels like the kind of prayer that we need today, doesn't it? In this kind of world, this is what we need. We need a God who will come in to the dirt at the heart of the world and will be here with us. We don't need a cosmic vending machine. We need a God who's going to get down into the cracks with us, into real life, and who in those cracks will stretch out his arms to bridge us to heaven. We need a God who gets down into real stuff, into the real world that is around us. We need the kind of God that we see in Jesus Christ. Jesus who came to show us a God who will take the worst we can do. All the hatred and betrayal, all of the slander, all of the the, the sinfulness and the broken nature of this world, and on a torture instrument will stretch out his arms to welcome all, whose love and mercy and grace are strong enough to open heaven, even to people like us. What we need is that kind of God in the midst of a broken world who will get into those broken places and stretch out his arms to embrace it all. What we need is a God who will get down and wrestle with us. Wrestle with this kind of world. Wrestle with the brokenness that surrounds us. And with that kind of God, prayer becomes that sort of grappling with his mercy and grace. How can it be, Lord God, that you love a world like this? How can it be, Lord God, that you would love and have mercy on the folks on that other side of the political aisle? How can it be, Lord God, in the midst of this kind of world that grace and mercy is still enough? And what this world needs is a people who have been so struck by God's grace, so struck by God's mercy and transformed, that they are willing to take that great love that God has for this kind of world and all of the suffering that surrounds us and allow them to meet in our own hearts to let the great love of God meet the great suffering of the world and in our hearts to dwell, to hold those opposing poles. Because that is prayer, isn't it? That is communion with the kind of God that Jesus shows. That is taking both God's mercy and the brokenness of the world seriously, which is what we call prayer. And in us being that meeting place. Now make no mistake, that's going to hurt. That's going to knock us out of joint and we're going to be different by that, right? God's mercy for a world like this and people like us, that leaves a mark. And we're going to be transformed by grace. By grappling with that kind of God, we are going to be changed. And we become the lenses for God's light.
There's a story told a number of years ago on Lake Erie. A number of years ago, there was a terrible storm that blew up, as storms will, on, on the lakes. And in this terrible storm was a boat that got lost. They lost their way, and they were out in this storm. They could see the light of the lighthouse there. They could see the light of the lighthouse, but they couldn't see the channel markers. And without those channel markers, they didn't know where they were in relation to the harbor that would keep them safe. And so there on the bridge, they were arguing and wondering, what do we do? We see the light. We don't know how to get to the safety that it shows. And one of the sailors came up and said, this is my home port. I grew up here, and I know it better than the back of my hand. I know what to do. Turn to starboard, and you'll be safe. So they turned to starboard, and they immediately hit the seawall. And the boat was, broke apart, and they all drowned except for four. Now, I tell you this story for a reason. And the reason is, light, we know that Jesus is the lighthouse, right? That's pretty clear in a story like this. Jesus is the lighthouse. But the thing about a lighthouse is, as I said with the kids, lighthouses always have all the light they need. Lighthouses have enough light. And so what they need is a lens that can show it, but they need channel markers. For a lighthouse to save lives needs channel markers so that people know where to turn and where to go in the midst of the storms. And that, to me, sounded a lot like us. Jesus doesn't need us to somehow bear down and make ourselves, our hind ends, glow like some sort of a lightning bug. Jesus doesn't need us to somehow create light because we can't. Jesus has plenty of light in this kind of world, even in this kind of darkness, and even in this kind of election. What Jesus needs is folks who can focus that light, but especially channel markers, so that others can know how to come to that light. Channel markers. That others can know where safety is. Channel markers. Lives that have been transformed, that have experienced God's grace, that have been knocked out of joint by love, that have experienced a God who will come into the middle of this world and in the middle of this world stretch out his arms to embrace all. A God who will open up heaven to folks like us. A God who will grapple and roll with us in the dirt. A God who takes this world seriously. God so in love with this world that he would give his only son. Friends, today we encounter that love in bread and wine, in word, in each other. Blessed to share our light, blessed to be channel markers, blessed so that others may come to know God's love. Thanks be to God.